Hello, this is Independent Media from Canada. My name's Jack Etkin. It's July 16th. This week, we're going to look at chemtrails, housing and homelessness, cleaning up the tar sands, climate change, and more. All too often, when we look up at the sky these days, we see strange white clouds that don't really belong there. Here is Ed Johnson with the story about chemtrails. When I first started hearing about chemtrails 10 or 20 years ago, I put it down to exaggerated claims with no facts, just hearsay. And then there was a video of a landowner in California who tested his soil and found unusual amounts of heavy metals, metals and compounds like aluminum, arsenic, barium, and lead. But the clincher for me was the publication of these photos, which are following, showing proof of aerosol dispersing equipment in modern jet planes. Have a look. This is what a normal sky should look like, but increasingly it is looking like this and this. The government, together with our media, would like us to believe these are nothing but vapor trails from jet engines, but in reality, we are being exposed to massive amounts of particulates. Nationally recognized board-certified neurosurgeon Dr. Russell Blaylock warns against the spraying of tons of nano-sized aluminum compounds. Nano-sized particles, he says, are infinitely more reactive. Of special concern is the effect of these nanoparticles on the brain and spinal cord with diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Lou Gehrig's, or ALS. In addition to inhaling nanoaluminum, such spraying will saturate the ground, water, and vegetation. We are already seeing a dramatic increase in these neurological disorders, and it is occurring in younger people than ever before. Here are six recent headlines regarding the global engineering assaults that some say represent the most dire and immediate threat to life, short of nuclear cataclysm. At its core, chemtrails, or geoengineering, as it is more properly called, is a scheme to try to affect weather patterns to offset global warming. But the latest information showing alarming increases in yearly warm weather patterns shows it is making the problem worse, and all at the expense of a public which was kept in the dark about what is really going on in the skies above them. On a more positive note, with the exception of Floridans, North Americans are reporting fewer aerosol trails in their skies this year. Maybe public awareness is finally having an effect. We all know we have a big problem with both homelessness and high house prices in Canada. The real question is why? Homelessness and high house prices in Canada are two sides of the same coin. The underlying problem is that we don't have enough houses in our towns and cities for the people who live here. Canada has a housing supply crisis, but government and industry know how much housing we Canadians need, and they are deliberately not building enough. This shortage of housing is the number one cause of homelessness and high house prices and high rents. And this housing shortage has been matched by our governments with record low interest rates and a lot of other little tricks over the years to keep pushing house prices up. And who wins? Well, why would a corporation want to sell a housing unit for $100,000 when they can sell that same unit for $300,000 or $400,000? And our politicians have opened Canada up to rampant speculation by anyone in the world 
who wants to make money from our homes, which has, of course, pushed house prices up again. The result of all of this is the exact disaster we have seen for the past half dozen years. Tens of thousands of homeless people, because there are not enough homes, and high house prices and high rents for exactly the same reason, not enough homes. But huge fortunes are being made by the 1% of the 1% from all of this, and that is why all of this has been happening. Homelessness, high house prices, and high rents are not an accident. They are a deliberate corporate plan carried out to maximize their profits. Remember, we live in the second biggest country in the world with only 35 million people and every natural resource, but they tell us we can't build enough housing for the people who live here. This is nonsense. We need our governments to start to act for the people of Canada, not for the corporations of Canada. Had they done this for the past 20 years, we would have reasonable house prices, virtually no homelessness, and a much better society. But these aren't the things they want. What they want is profit, and that's what they've gotten, and societal desta destabilization. What's done is done, and those responsible should be held accountable. But more importantly, let's begin to fix up this mess. And that means our city governments, our provincial and our federal governments must stop betraying us and get back into the game of building housing for the people of Canada. Last week, we talked about the mess caused by oil in Alberta and opined that it might be impossible to clean up. But during the week, I read several articles and saw a documentary about how mushrooms, especially the oyster mushroom, can be used to clean up oil contamination and even radionuclides. I guess I've been programmed by watching too much TV. Evidently, we just need to use our imaginations. If you're interested in this topic, Google Paul Stamets, oyster mushrooms and contamination, either oil or radionuclides. Canada is still slated to be the second country in the world to fully legalize cannabis, although other countries are making great strides. For example, you can soon buy HiMat brand cannabis cigarettes in grocery stores in Switzerland. These cigarettes have less than 1% THC, the psychoactive component of cannabis, but a whopping 20% CBDs, which is the medicinal component, according to articles on the web. Uruguay is nearing the time when cannabis will be available for around $1 per gram, but only to Uruguayans, as the government does not want a cannabis tourism industry to develop. Many of the scenes we're seeing around the world still look like people who are in different movies. For example, last week, police in Lyon, France, were terrified when they found a field of what looked like cannabis, but was really an art installation. Much to the chagrin of the artists, the police quickly destroyed what they perceived as evil herbs. You should have a sign, they told the artists. Cities in Canada are still hazy on the issue of how to regulate and control and tax sales of the plant and its derivatives. We will continue to watch and keep you updated on these interesting developments as they happen. Thank you, Will. Now let's turn to forest fires and the climate change that's causing them. British Columbia is on fire right now, and it's only going to get worse. All of us, not only in BC, but around the world, are in very serious trouble because of climate change. Here in Canada, we've been betrayed by our politicians and our media. They've ignored and downplayed this climate disaster for decades because Canada's politicians and Canada's media work for the oil industry, the car industry, and the banks, and all they care about is more profit. They have placed corporate profit ahead of our lives and the life of our planet, and now it's all falling apart. The North Pole is melting. A trillion ton chunk of ice has just broken off from the Antarctic. Things are getting worse, and there is no going back. But even yet, as the world burns and the climate changes, virtually nothing is being done here in Canada. The Prime Minister waited for the markets to close before making his announcement on pipelines 
in order to minimize any instability. There isn't a country in the world that would find billions of barrels of oil and leave it in the ground while there is a market for it. Decisions that have pitted environmentalists against oil producers. If I thought this project was unsafe for the B.C. coast, I would reject it. And with these words, the Trudeau government approved the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain project that runs from Alberta to Burnaby, British Columbia, a project that has sparked protests across the country. What we don't want to be doing is investing in infrastructure that's going to increase our emissions, our carbon emissions. Our politicians have got to stop murdering us. We have got to put our children's futures ahead of corporate profit. Our future jobs must come from something smarter than more cars, more oil, and more environmental disaster. We can do this, but we've got to change, and we've got to change fast. We can't have more of this. Even in Dallas, Texas, they are seeing the light. Today, many cities are building out their own light rail systems, and they're hoping to create magnets for economic development. And Dallas has become an unlikely leader. Since launching in 1996, DART has become the longest light rail system in the country, with 62 stations and 90 miles of track stretching all the way to DFW Airport. Adjusting for inflation, it cost more than $8 billion to build. Here in downtown Dallas, DART's four light rail lines converge, and this is one of their busiest stations. About 100,000 riders use the light rail each weekday. Open land around these new train stations presented new opportunities for development, another selling point. Just steps away from Mockingbird Station behind me, you can find a movie theater, shops, restaurants, apartments, and office space. This is what DART points to as a model for the kind of development that can be built around train stations. And this is the future that we all have to embrace if we want to save ourselves. As usual, the corporate media focused on the violence in order to avoid telling us why hundreds of thousands of people were protesting the G20 peacefully. The media always does this because they don't want us to know what is really going on with the G20. This cartoon sums it up well. Thanks for watching this week's news from independent media in Canada. I'm Will Smith.